Welcome to A Moment with Modern Mentors. Hi, Erica. Great to have you on the podcast. Um, It's A Moment with Modern Mentors, and this season, season two, is called A Call for Change, and we're talking to you from London. So thanks so much for getting up early, and I know you're in lockdown over there. Thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to to be here. Yeah, so I am Erica, and I am the founder of Dachbad. Dachbad is effortless style curated for men, a subscription service that uh, makes men dress well throughout the year with no effort. So I can't wait to hear all about Dapad. Um, Tell us how you got started with it because it's, you know, you've launched it a few years ago and it's really been your baby, hasn't it? Yes, it has. So um, I launched it or the idea came really sort of was inspired by my husband and our sort of failed shopping trips. Um, He was a well-to-do guy, uh, but no time and absolutely zero interest in, um, in sort of like, you know, picking the right clothes, you know, like most men, they want to look good. He wanted to do it as well. But you could see when he was sort of handed something, a piece of nice clothing, he appreciated it, but it was just not on. And uh, we tried shopping trips and it mostly ended up having an argument and um, whatever, searching for the closest bar. (laughs) And then I thought, well, I was working in finance at that time and I was just looking around me and he were were all these well-to-do men, but sort of with often no interest, no time, just sort of a bit like lost in how to just look good effortless, effortlessly. And what was your kind of background that brought you into the fashion world? Had you had a, a background in fashion? Not at all. I mean, I, um, as I said, like, I mean, I have an economics degree and I st- uh, worked in finance for eight years when I came to London. But fashion and I would say design in general has always been just a passion of mine. And When I look back, a similar thread is for friends to always being asked me to sort of help them shopping. And I think it's sort of like almost just a natural talent in a way that like, you know, I can just see what fits and then I plan my wardrobe. I always plan my own wardrobe throughout the years. I thought it's sort of a natural extension and, you know, I can just take my skill and help, help men or help people sort of. Help your husband first and foremost. (laughs) So is he dressing better these days? Oh, much better. <laughs> and so when you first launched Dapad, did you have a very simple idea of um, being able to kind of provide men with a, more of a solution or did you kind of have a bigger ambition? Yeah, so again, as you say, like I think most business start sort of like, I think I knew sort of in my heart or like in my gut what I wanted it to be. But um, I think, again, you get maybe a bit lost as well. You look at what other competitors are doing and you try to sort of replicate that. So in the first, it was just sort of the solution of shopping, but there wasn't sort of, even though we always had the sort of beautiful Scandinavian clothes, the minimalist style, we sort of, were, we were put sort of in the same basket as these other guys. But then as I sort of evolved, I realized, well, it's more than just solving the process. It's also about the quality of clothes. It's also about um, the actual, like, I'm not sending random clothes. I'm sending it to you, you know, as a perfect outfit for your type of life. And then as we then got to know customers and the people who then subscribe for three boxes a year, we said, well, this is perfect. Now we know what you have. And then we just build the wardrobe from everything that they bought so that like, you know, they basically all their sort of wardrobe needs are taken care of throughout the year. So it's that sort of like just this effortless style as it is. Like I can dress well effortless without trying too hard in beautiful sort of well curated clothes. I mean, we sort of, we don't really provide any and I don't want to provide any sort of high street brands. It's a very sort of niche. Also price bracket, which is the affordable luxury uh, price bracket, which I see is like the, the sort of optimal point where you combine price and quality and I don't know, because maybe I'm Swedish and in Scandinavia, we always, we, you know, we love design, you know, people tend to be quite well dressed, but we also pay a lot of taxes so we don't have that much money to spend. Mm-hmm. And it's no wonder that almost this affordable luxury sort of segment of the market is, you know, originates from Scandinavia, where, you know, again, you have this very good quality, but it's like, it's not like a Gucci price point or, or you know, um, several you know 500 pounds for a shirt instead it's like 150 pounds for a shirt or 
Um, and, so- and and I mean, I think one of the things that um, you know I, I love about DAPAD is the fact that you're very much um, thinking about the environment and about um, you know sustainability within the curation. So tell us a little bit more about you know where your journey is there with the with the business and and personally as well, I guess. Yeah, so I am. I am in. I mean, in my personal life, I am a little bit of an activist, and I'm a big environmentalist. And of course, as we know, fast fashion and fashion has is a big sort of offender, and we need to change the way fashion works. And again, I would say there's two sort of parts to the sustainability, um, uh, you know, sort of ethos for that. But so one is, of course, that. This Scandinavian sort of timeless fashion, it doesn't expire. It's like clothes without an expiry date. So if I buy a beautiful white shirt and a navy chino or something, those will look as good in three years time. You know, like they, they're not gonna like, I'm not gonna have to re- replenish all the time. And okay, this season is this, or this season is that. You know, we can't always have new every, every, every six months or every three months or whatever it is now. So that is one part. And uh, of course, it's the quality. The quality is super good. Again, like the shirts, you can wash them over and over again. They they work out. And then uh, it is also because we have the skill set of both of that, but of how we combine the things. So the clothes sort of transcend from one event to another. Like you, you know, if you're smart, if you have a smart casual dress code, for example, at work, well, that will look as well when you go to the, you know, to the pub maybe afterwards, and you just maybe you lose the jacket or something. And then again, for for an event in the in the weekend, there are small changes. Maybe you just change the shirt with the chino and it sort of dresses it up. So you just have to buy a bit less, I think. So that's, but then also like now we have, of course, a core core brands, but then also we're now really looking to just add brands that have a sustainability ethos per se, like that's the outspoken thing. So for example, we have uh, one brand that just makes all the outerwear from recycled plastic from the ocean. Uh, we have uh, one of the Nordic sort of eco brands to get is called Swanen or the Swan. It's very, very hard to get. And one of our brands made the first uh, Swanen labeled uh, Chino and Jean. It's again, it fills all this criteria of how, how the, the product can be recycled, what is recyclable, um, it's organic products, um, you know, all these sorts of things. So that's what we're adding a lot. Of course, as well, animal agriculture, as we know, is one of the biggest um, culprits for climate change. And what we're trying to do as well is just sort of phase out the use in, of animals in, in, um, in the clothes that we use. So for example, we, we, we never had feathers or fur or exotic leathers, but what we also now try to do is we phase out animal leathers and we're looking for these amazing companies that use this new technology, which is called biofabrication, where they use plants. So apples is very, for example, common. You can make mm-hmm. amazing leather from apple skin. You know, it's the future of leather, like it's going to sort of make the animal leather redundant. So those are the things that we... Um, we, we we work for and and um, you know look for it's a big 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 passion for it. <laughs> And it may, I mean, it really changes the fashion business entirely, doesn't it? Because it, it makes fashion so much more deep. I mean, fashion, fast fashion is just, you know, it is the ultimate consumption kind of mistake really for our environment and planet. But the fact that you can actually change the way that fashion behaves as across the board and not only people and how they behave, but how an industry behaves, it's, um, you know, something to be amazingly proud of. Well done. Um, I think it, it, it is coming and it's like again like I see again like in Sweden you have I think you have two quite large brands as well and this is all the thing that they do they just curate also you create the basic pieces you know you curate a, a, like an wardrobe without expiry date and and you know like the, I was reading somewhere that fashion means change but you know I think we need to change that in a way like you know fashion we can't have yeah. change and change yeah change change is what everyone has been kind of you know moving on and having to kind of keep up with it whereas now it's almost like fashion is classic pieces yes. that can be you know sensible and worn well and and in a number of ways and I think you see on places like Netta Porter you know them really talking about a piece and how yes. many outfits it can be worn with now you can really see the difference in the way that fashion is starting to sell their product and it's all sure. about quality um and so what does this mean for a business like yours? You've started it from scratch. It's, a, it's an online business. You're servicing to the UK and also across Europe at the moment. Yes. 
talk us through how you've launched this online business. How does that come about for someone that isn't in fashion and, you know, you've done, you've done an economics degree, fantastic, but, you know, you're not a, a tech person, are you? You make many mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, I made so many mistakes in the beginning and, um, uh, you know, you sort of just sort of like, I would say, plodle through. You sort of like you, you obviously like, you know, of course, I, I wrote a business plan. I had, a, I had an idea and then I, 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 I got redundancy from my, uh, my bank and I just basically took the money and, um, you know, you know, started this. I mean, I think we're on our fourth site now, um, which is now we're very happy with. But it's just been a big learning curve all through. And, um, you know, I think one of my main mistakes was just not finding a partner from the start um, like that has sort of, you know, complementary skill sets to, to me. That would have been much easier. I think that's for anybody who starts a business, try and find a partner that sort of complements you. Mm. Uh, but, yeah, anyway, I just, you know, the first site was up. I bought a bit of clothes. I contacted brands. Brands was actually quite you know, forthcoming, you know, bought a bit of stock, just tried. I mean, my, my husband's work colleagues were one of my few, first few customers. And it was just like, I was just making the box in my, in my, what is now my daughter's bedroom. You know, like, it's like, but somehow, I don't know, maybe the universe conspires sometimes and you meet certain people on the right time and then they propel you forward and things happen. And I had my old boss from, from the bank also like invested in, in the business. Um, so we had capital and, yeah and we from the start we got very good reviews like um you know we you know we were just like sort of six months in and we were in gq and we were in the times and people were just like because i think one of the skills that i do have is that i i do know the clothes very well and i'm very good at putting the outfits together i think that sort of like just lifted the business and people thought wow this is looks so professional this looks so was we were like two girls there in the bedroom <laughs> Yeah, well, your style is is amazing and, you know, you just have to look on the website to see the photography and the styling and the clothes that you're producing and presenting look so incredible, such high quality and just and a nuance, a kind of sense of humour that, you know, you really bring across in the brand. Talk us a little bit through the brand itself, Dapad, and how you came up with the brand and, and what that sense of humour is for you. Yeah, I think like, uh, as I say, like, um, like, again, I think fashion sometimes again takes he, itself too seriously when you see everybody sitting on the catwalks and look, ooh, they look really fancy and they have the sunglasses <laughs> on and like, you go like, ooh. <laughs> and I think that also puts men off a bit. Mm. I think it puts them off, it feels daunting and it feels a bit like I'm trying too hard. And um, and I think that's that's what we wanted to bring this sort of humor into to it so that men sort of it sort of de-dramatizes it and they just realize that like, you know what, I, I can look good without trying too hard and I'm just gonna enjoy it because actually looking good, most people do enjoy that. That's sort of how the humor is like and you know, like it's like I don't take myself too seriously. Um, you know, and this is this should be fun, you know, it's only it's clothes. Yeah. <laughs> and how many, um, how many years into the business are you now? Whereabouts are you in the business cycle? Would you four, four years into the business. Um, but again, it's like, it's, it's been, uh, it's been sort of a roller coaster, you know, coming here as well in my personal life. So was, it's, it's been going for four years. I think, um, you know, because of the things that happened in my personal life, it was sort of like, it was, it was going, but I wasn't like putting all my effort into it. Was it now, of course, with my new partners, you know, a new site, it's like now it's the time for us to sort of um, to grow and to expand. And I think it's, it's, it's the right timing as well when you look at what's happening in the world. So, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of hit on a point that we wanted to uh, just talk about today. And, I, and I, you know, I've checked with you prior to this interview, but, you know, tell us a little bit about what, what's gone on in your personal life to make such a, you know, impact on the business. And I guess it has in a way changed the way you've approached the business now, hasn't it? Yes, it has. So yeah, when so I started the business when I was then pregnant with with my with my daughter, and um, um, obviously that's uh, anybody who's had a first child know it's actually quite challenging. Maybe I thought it's of, time to start a business. <laughs> yeah, you, you're so naive. You think like, well, once you sleep, I'm going to be able to work, and you know, I'm going to have so much energy, and you don't actually know as a woman as well how it sort of affects your sort of. I guess your confidence as well and how you're feeling in your body and all of these things just play. But then also when she was eight months old, I got diagnosed with breast cancer. So 
that was one and a half year of sort of, of quite like harsh treatments, you know, with chemotherapy or radio, radiotherapy surgery and some hormone treatments afterwards. So it was just so, it was just so overwhelming. And like, um, I felt physically very ill for, for that period of time. But also like actually coming through it, it took me years to just sort of get back my confidence, get back sort of my mojo. And all this time I was like, because when I was, when I was, I had my first fundraise just when I sort of like, you know, um, was sort of mid chemo and I don't understand how I did it. Like, you know, I was sitting there like in this meeting and it's like my, my gums were bleeding, you know, because of this chemotherapy. And I was just like, but after that, I just had to like, I said to my husband, like, I see, I said, nothing sort of, I cannot take like more sort of drama in my life. And then I just said like, okay, I'm just going to have to find a level where the business sort of pays for itself, you know, like where I can just cut costs and I still have the revenues that come in from my existing customers and just try and like make it survive like that. And that's what I did. So like having gone from like, okay, let's just grow, let's fundraise, let's do this. Like, you know, I just had to like put the brake on and scale back and just yeah, take yeah. Now we are we are in such a good place again if we're not we're looking to raise some funds now and we have made I made mistakes but I made them on a very small scale so I haven't like mm-hmm. wasted people's money and mm-hmm. also throughout this time I've, I've worked on myself I've worked on the business I've done business courses and like sort of I think we found our true voice throughout this time. So now like when we're if we then you know are successful or when we are successful in raising these funds you know it's so much easier than to just like, you know, to actually use the, the funds in the, in the right way. Yeah. And I think that's a really interesting point because, you know, you've, you've started, it's very much been an organic business, but you yeah. have now got enough experience that you know, the mm-hmm. questions that are going to get thrown at you, you know, the, the way the landscape is, you've been through that um, firsthand once already. And so now going out and you, you say you're, you're raising money um, to find investors, you can really talk with confidence around what hurdles might be for any investor or potential investor so what tell us a little bit about your business kind of approach and um firstly want to say thank you for sharing that personal story because I I know it already but um you know obviously that's a very poignant part in your life and you know thank goodness you've recovered and come through it and look at you know things are booming in in the business world tell us a little bit about your business background and how you know you've said you've done a little bit of study throughout the the period as well what kind of approach are you taking to business in terms of you know holistically but also for DAPAD so I think like um um I am a big fan of Seth Godin and I've done a few of his um, of his sort of courses and I read his books and I also did like I like this entrepreneur called Marie Forleo um, that I follow mm. when I did her courses and I think um, they all say don't try to be something for everybody just make something that's really really great for this one sort of person that you have in mind Seth Godin like he wrote this very famous book which is called The Purple Cow um which sort of became like iconic and that's just what he says because he says if you try to be something for everybody you become nobody or you become bland and then also you become then also you need enormous amounts of money because nobody's going to sort of notice you but like find the smallest viable market as it says and then you work from there and that's how you then make your mark and of course it doesn't mean you have to stay there you can always expand then but that's like you sort of your dna is in there and that's how you go from there so i think it's also what I've learned with that, but rather in the beginning, I think we try to be maybe something for everybody and it didn't work. And now it's just, okay, I, what can I leverage? What I can leverage my Scandinavian sort of heritage. I can leverage my sort of sense of style and being Swedish. And I think that's what we have to put into the DNA of that, but rather than trying to be, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, you could really feel a personality with Dapad. And I think that's really, you know, very much coming across in the brand, but also, you know, the, the personality of the business and the way that you approach it from a personal perspective as well. Um, I guess one of the big parts of your life, which you kind of touched on, but not quite, is that you're a vegan, and I mean, is this affecting your, um, you know, approach to business and obviously a fashion business? We've, we talked about sustainability, but, you know, veganism is obviously quite an extreme end of the scale in terms of, um, you know, no meat, no dairy. 
Um, talk us through how that affects the fashion world because the fashion world's not there yet in terms of no. <laughs> being <No>. vegan. <laughs> it's not for sure. Um, but, again, it is changing, and I think it's, think it's changing also quite fast. Yes, so I am... Um, so the cancer sort of propelled me to being vegan. And whilst I was vegan primarily for health reasons to start with, it evolved to become a sort of a thing that is bigger than me. And um, ultimately, like, you know, the way we treat non-human animals, um, um, you know, is, is something that, that's just very cruel, very wrong that we're doing as humans. And, and again, the, the, the part of animal agriculture in, in climate change is like the number one thing a human one person can do in his or her life is to, to change a plant-based diet to alleviate uh, his or her like carbon footprint or, or you know that damage to to the planet so so that's sort of yeah and that, that is obviously part of my um of that but now i can't sort of with good conscience sell leather shoes anymore or, or i can sell leather shoes leather that's made from plants but you know, before I didn't use to blink when it says calf leather and then I sort of think, this is actually a calf, it's a baby cow. I'm like, no, <laughs> I, I, no this, is not, this is not on anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but then I'm, I'm looking for alternatives and it's quite, again, it's interesting to see whilst the fashion industry doesn't maybe primarily approach it from an ethical point of view, the, um, the sustainability uh, aspect of it is of course uh, very, uh, very strong. And now when I go to, to fashion showrooms and the lights, there are so many now um, shoe brands and other things that are using just plant leather, but from a sustainability point of view. I mean, people talk a lot about polyester and these things, but actually like when you look at the data, it is, um, it is animal products that's the worst for the environment. So, so le leather, for example. Um, <laughs> Does that mean that you've cut leather and all animal products entirely from your collection? Yes. Yes. Okay, so it is a vegan brand. That it's you not vegan because we're using wool. You, wool. We're still using wool. Okay. Right. Yeah. So, so, so no, wool, no, wool, no, but no other products. And I mean, again, I think it's like if you see, like for example, fur. I mean, there's like if you if you sell fur, like you're like a dinosaur. Like there's all all brands like big also big fashion houses they not cut. They cut fur. Salisbury here in London hasn't sold fur in like I don't know how many you know, many years. And and again, it's all about this sort of more planet friendly um, alternatives. And like it's also interesting. One of my Danish brands was not a vegan brand, but I had a, a view the collection for autumn winter, and they're just using again they're just suddenly using recycled wool, you know, which is amazing. You're just taking the wool that's being that's already there, and then just making amazing new new jumpers. So vegan, so wool is a vegan and off the vegan list, is it? Why is that? Because if you're, if you're a vegan, you, you, you don't use wool. You can't wear wool. No, you can't wear wool because again, it's like, it's, um, it's, it's uh, well, it, it comes from an animal, but, okay. but it, it's quite hard. It's, that, that is a tricky one in the yeah. fashion world. Well, Stella McCartney, who's um, um, obviously very ethical and, you know, she uses her own wool she actually has her own sheep, which is quite extraordinary. So she makes sure that the sheep are well treated. Uh, so that's part of her, like she actually owns the farm. Was it normally like a fashion brand, obviously sourced the wool from, from a farm. Ah, okay. So she's made. That's how she sold it. Like, so there are ways, there are ways like around it. And uh, yeah. And that was Stella McCartney, was it? She's been uh, in the, in this space for probably the beginning 10 it's, years now. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. She's, yeah, even, even further, I think, yeah, like 2001 yeah. or something, yeah. Yeah. So with this new part of your life being that you are, uh, you know, and a vegan and and you've, have you infiltrated your family with this? this yeah, they're all vegan. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's vegan. And how long have you been vegan for and, and what does it mean uh, to look like for you? I've been vegan now, is it four years, five years, something like that, yeah. And it's just, it's just part of a life. It's not something sort of we, you know, uh, you know, I mean, of course we, we think about it every day. I mean, I'm sort of a vegan activist. So, but it's like, it's just so natural. Like for my daughter, it's natural for my husband, you know, we just, you know, we eat healthy plants every day. And um, um, it's just, but it's, it, it's, it's sort of also, it's empowering because you know, sort of you're doing something good for the planet and, 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 teaching, and teaching your daughter to also appreciate 
the food that's going into her body so much so you've written a couple of children's books with her right yes, I have, yeah tell us about I, uh, that yeah, so I, um, when we went vegan, then after a while, of course, I tried to speak to my daughter about it. Um, and like, we bought a few books, but it was sort of like, I was like, oh, I'm not sure, you know, like, you know, when you look at children, they really love uh, a character like Elsa from Frozen. Mm-hmm. So, you know, why, why don't we create a vegan Elsa? Or like, um, so we created Levi, who's like this sort of protagonist in, in the two books. And um, we actually don't mention the word vegan. We just says Levi is a girl. She eats plants. She doesn't eat animals. You know, she loves uh, she loves the planet. She loves the animals. And we we talk about how plants make her big and strong. And we try and just connect the children with the food on their plate because they think that like you know you buy ham in a shop. You have the children has no concept that this was actually a, a living pig that yeah. had a mummy and daddy. And um, yeah, so that's like it's just like speaking truthfully to children about food choices. So maybe if they can make choices that are well informed, we can have a change earlier in in this world. I don't know about in London, but certainly in Australia, vegan options for adults is pretty limited, and it's I I don't even know if it's actually available in a in a child format. But yeah. talk us through how that works in terms of you know, maybe goes to school, so you know she's around a lot of kids and. And how does how does it kind of integrate into her world as a young child? It's sort of like she she's just used to it because she's always been that like yeah, or she was eighteen months when she was sort of like when we all went vegan. So she she just knows that like you know oh yeah my friends eat animals but I don't. But she's sort of starting to find her own voice and is a bit of an activist. We watched the Greta movie. I am Greta, you know Greta Thunberg, and she's like oh yeah okay I'm gonna start saying you know because sometimes. <laughs> bit like it's a bit and I said like of course you should never comment or or like be derogatory but you can always but that doesn't stop you from sort of standing up for what you believe in like and so I think she's sort of coming to to terms with that and luckily she has her best friend who's vegan too they're like the only vegans in the school and but they're <laughs> in a group so yeah. I think it was yeah, they found each other <laughs> and, but it's just, it's just part of part of the lives and she knows what you can and not have but we've also super open-minded parents so you're a wife, you're a mom, and you're a business woman, an entrepreneur. How do you kind of manage all of this life together in lockdown? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the whatever the question everybody asks themselves every day, right? I don't know. I mean, especially in lockdown and homeschooling, it's it's not easy. That's for sure. Homeschooling on, on top of that as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Like you somehow. You somehow make it work and you think you need to set boundaries, you set priorities. I know that like my my daughter is super important to me and um, of course my family as well. So was you know, of course growing the business is too and but my health is also important and exercising and friends. And in a way, like you just I think beforehand, before cancer, I my main focus always was just work and producing and achieving. I was quite highly strung. Um, and whilst I still want to, you know, sort of make a difference and, and work, I also know that I need rest um, to sort of to, to be at my best. I also know that I don't want to miss out on my, my, my daughter's, you know, life and when she's growing up and, you know, just have a healthy relationship, healthy body, healthy mind. You know, I just try and be very realistic, you know. Yeah. And I mean, do you find that things kind of you a little bit more um, kind of, I guess, uh, go with the flow about how things work out now do you feel like you've changed before and after both the cancer and, and, and having a business of your own where you just how ha- you're not maybe not as in control as you were before no and I think if you're super spot on there and I think that's again like we, we think we are in control um but then things happen in your life and also having a child I think you just realize you have no control <laughs> of, uh, of them so I think yeah at the moment I'm a big fan of Eckhart Tolle I don't know if you know you know the power of now mm-hmm. and a new world and he, you know the only thing I try to be is just in the present and as he says like if whatever you if you want a good future then do the best of the of now you know yeah. and we also used to obsess about how things were going to pan out and of course I'm not immune like sometimes I just go like especially now with the new site, I mean, you know, like, oh, is it going to work? Oh, is it going to be blah, blah. like, in the end, I'm like, okay, well, I can do what I can now. And then, you know, the outcome will, you know, you sort of will be what will be. Yeah, I've, I've definitely found um, that things generally happen in the way that they're meant to, regardless of whether you're, you know, 
you're trying to drive it in one direction or not, the outcome is kind of already. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, like I mean, you do some you do some yoga, right? You know, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm a big, the Bhagavad Gita. You always says like, you know, don't attach the fruit to your work. Yeah. Because you care about the fruit that your work is doing, and that's what I sort of I keep thinking. Like I just do whatever I can the best now, and then yeah, yeah, we'll exactly. And that's all you can do, isn't it? You've really just got to try your hardest, and and that's all you're capable of. Um, so has you know we've talked a little bit about the fact that you're in London and 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 still in lockdown, which is you know it's been a long year. It's almost exactly a year, right? Or maybe a little bit more for you guys. Um, how has that been in terms of just productivity and being able to kind of, uh, you know, keep the business, you know, energy going or actually has it helped? How, how have you responded to, you know, the change of environment? The first lockdown was not good at all in terms of productivity and all. And then it was also because homeschooling was new. So the, the schools weren't really set up. It demanded a lot of time from the parents. What I managed, I managed like, and because my husband is also working full time and he's like a bit, you know, hard to take time off work. So I had one day when I could sort of really go into work, focus, get boxes out. And like, I had to sort of find hours here and there. This lockdown, we're much more organized because you're allowed to mix households. So I had help as well coming, you know, with homeschooling. And the teachers are very well set up. So they sort of like, they almost lead the whole day so that you can actually have, you know, I can sit in the room, but I can still sort of get work done. done. So I think we're seeing the end of it. And we had, of course, Boris Johnson announced the, the plan out that homeschooling is ending now 8th of March. So I think, you know, sort of like things, again, things are happening. Yes, they're, they're meant to be. Our new site is going to be up by then. Lockdown is easing, you know, we're, we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. But yeah, lockdown is not good for productivity. <laughs> and um, I mean, having an online business, how does uh, how does that work in terms of being able to dispatch and get product out to customers? Has it has it affected so it? We, yeah, we do it ourselves still. So uh, it's just, luckily the sort of our, our office and small warehouse is close to where we live, so we can just walk there and do that. And we're sort of alone there, so that's okay. And we've done this throughout lockdown, so we, we've never stopped, and we've always been able to send send clothes and send to new customers and to our subscription people. That's happening still. Mm. I mean, in fact, subscription is probably one of those businesses that is finding, a, a, you know, a, a more meaning in a situation mm. where people can't go to the shops. Have you found yeah. your business has actually kind of seen a, a lift? Not, not so much in the clothing sector. I was talking to a person about it, and, of course, subscription when it comes to food or um, you know, maybe flowers, all of these sort of things. They, of course, in a huge uptick. For clothes, it's sort of like it's, it's been flat or a slight like decline just because people are really not going out. I mean, people sit in their sweatpants every day um, at home. So, have you changed? But it's, it's at least been a decline for us. And I think now, again, I think we're in a good position now with lockdown easing and our proposition and everything. So, I, I, I you know, I'm hopeful now for the future. Yeah, and I guess, you know, what um, very much in line with your business model is that it's all about quality and long-lasting product um, and the, the fact that you could be kind of working on your proposition over the course of the period, the time, um, now you're able to kind of come back with a, a really strong offer for your audience. Um, so with that in mind, what are the plans for DAPAD in 2021? Yeah, so again, we have this uh, new look, new site coming up, new functionality. I'm actually super excited. I think we have managed to sort of capture this sort of tongue-in-cheek humor um, and effortless style, really showing off the clothes in a better way. Um, uh, much more inspiration on the site, much more sort of actually telling who we are. It's personal, it's human. Um, so that's that. That should be up hopefully in the coming week, I hope. Uh, again, we're trying to do a fundraise as well to just sort of be able to spread our message in a faster way. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's it, I think. Yeah. Big, big plans, getting, getting an investor to invest in the business. Tell us a little bit how that works. Is that someone that comes in and kind of has a background in, in an area that you're interested in or is it a, it's just funding and they... Take him yeah. He's funding these angel investors who just sort of, uh, you know, who, uh, you know, think it's a good business opportunity, but they wouldn't, it wouldn't be sort of part of running the daily business or anything like that. Yeah. 
And, and I mean, you've done that in the past because you had a, a, an angel investor at the beginning. And so now this is a second round of investment for the business. So you're kind of an experienced um, <laughs> <laughs> investment pitcher. How do you kind of, you know, again, you've come with, you've come from the banking sector, but you've come with a business as a business um, or an uh, economics background is this kind of a comfortable place for you in terms of going out and you know selling and pitching your business to investors or is it kind of I I think very few people enjoy it like I even look like I I follow Sophie Amoroso who started you know Nasty Gal and like you know wrote Girl Boss and even she you think she's like you know, like rock hard, and she's like, I hate fundraising. <laughs> it's not, I, I, I would be surprised if anybody likes it, but you know, <laughs> it has to be done. Yeah. Um, and one of the things, and you've talked actually, I think about three books already, or maybe it's two books that you like, but um, we like to ask our guests about a favorite book that they like to recommend. So we will bank the two that you've given us, and I think you need yeah. to give us a third one. Um, what's a favorite book that you love and recommend? I, I read in actually in first lockdown and I still keep talking to people about it. Uh, a Little Life. I don't know a Little Life. It. A Little yeah. Life. It, um, it's, it's become very famous. I mean, I sort of was in, I felt like I was bereaved after like a week after I cried for like 30 minutes <laughs> and I finished it. It truly is like one of the best books I've I, I, I read and like when you and I started googling it, I was like became a bit obsessed. And <laughs> it is on the list of the world's best ever sort of written books. And it's like it's a, it was a debut debut novel for the for the author as well. Um, and it's just amazing how she in eighteen months managed to put together this masterpiece. But a little What's the story. Reading. What's the story? It's it follows. Um, four men, four friends um, who all live sort of in New York and um, from sort of college uh, times up until they are like in their 50s and 60s and sort of jump time. So just how, how their lives develop and what different routes they are taking and you're following a person called Jude, which has sort of like a, quite a traumatic, um, I guess, upbringing and which sort of is, you know, you find out more and more as the, as the book goes on, but it's beautiful. So. Okay, well, we're going to read that for sure. And um, I, I guess another question we like to ask as well is if you had a megaphone and you could stand up and talk to the world, what would be your message right now or, you know, what's what's on your mind? Yeah, well, I would, I would say that look, into, if you could, like, try and transition as much as possible to a plant-based lifestyle, um, I think we what's been missing in this COVID world is actually the reason to why COVID exists and it's a zoonotic disease. And three out of four zoonotic diseases, like I think even more, they say like, I mean, the Spanish flu, um, swine flu, um, you know, mad cow's disease, AIDS, all comes from the human's interaction with animals. So like by switching to a plant-based diet, as I say, you're not only solving or preventing a new pandemic to happen, you're also maybe preventing antibiotic resistance, which is one of the other world's biggest threats. You're helping with climate change, you're helping your own health, and you're of course alleviating the suffering of billions of, 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 of animals. So I think it's just this, this one step of just eating plants instead of animals is such a profound um, shift in what we could do to, to help this planet in so many ways. So yeah, that's what I do too. And do, yeah, as I said, like, Greta Thunberg says, I'm not telling people what to do, and it, it, it's true, but I like, you know, just do the research, as I say, like, you know, investigate, then, because then you find out yourself, watch documentaries, read books, you'll, you'll be amazed. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Erica. It's been absolutely wonderful talking to you. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe via your preferred podcast platform for more episodes of A Moment with Modern Mentors.